Welcome to Question Time, the place where people can put questions directly to those in power and those who want to be in power. Tonight we're in Skipton, the market town in North Yorkshire. It's been a safe Conservative seat for some time now and people here voted narrowly to leave the EU in 2016. Now our audience here has chosen this week as every week to reflect the recent voting record and range of opinion across the country as a whole. And tonight we're talking about why are millions of working age people not working? Should railway workers go on strike before Christmas? What about the NHS? Should wealthier people start to pay for their treatment? And is Matt Hancock actually starting to redeem himself in the jungle? Welcome to Question Time. Government, Richard Holden, who is a transport minister, having previously worked as a government special advisor, he became the first Conservative MP for North West Durham in 2019. The Mayor of Greater Manchester for the past five years is Labour's Andy Burnham. He was Culture, then Health Secretary under Gordon Brown's government before leaving Parliament in 2017. Often talked about as a future Labour leader, he's run for the leadership role twice, maybe third time lucky. Charlotte Ivers is the political correspondent for Times Radio. She also contributes to The New Statesman and writes about other things for the Sunday Times, such as why millennials like her have never been cool and the genius of Taylor Swift. Ben Habib moved from Pakistan to the UK as a teenager. He worked in finance and then founded his own property company. In 2019, he was elected to the European Parliament for the Brexit Party until the UK left the EU. Strong critic of the current government, especially over the Brexit agreement, he's considering a return to party politics. And Darren McGarvey's two books, the first of which won him the Orwell Prize, focus on poverty, social inequality and political power. He's also a rapper and hip-hop recording artist and his recent documentary series, Class Wars, won an RTS Scotland Award. Welcome. <laughs> Good evening, welcome to the panel. Welcome to our audience here in Skipton. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at, who, at home, joining the conversation the usual way on uh, social media. And let's hear what you've got to say. Right, should we kick off with our first question tonight, which is from Nikki Klaus. What would the panel do to encourage the economically inactive into the workplace? So, let's just get this, uh, get this in context. There are uh, just under 9 million economically inactive people. So that's people uh, who, who could work and are not working, and that is one-fifth of the working population. Is this something that concerns you, Nick? Is that why you're asking? Yes. And why does it concern you? Well, it's not very good for the economy, for the country, and for people themselves. Andy? I, I would um, suggest uh, people might look at some of the work we've been doing in Greater Manchester. So, under our devolution deal, we took some control of the DWP budget and it was specifically focused on people who've been out of the labour market for a long time. And basically what we did was we kind of reversed the process with regard to the DWP. If you think about the national approach, it's a tick box regime, you know, computer says no and, you know, people feel very dehumanised often in that, in that process and it doesn't match them with the, the skills that they want or the, or the thing that they're trying to get back to work to do. We built from the bottom up a much more personalised approach, much more mental health support, actually, because people do lose confidence if they're out of the labour market for a long time. And what we found was we had twice the success rate of the national work programme of getting people back into work. So I would say do that, you know, work with names, not numbers, you know, treat people as human beings, uh, not just as statistics. And the second thing I would do is, is put skills under local control. In this country, technical education and skills has always been treated as a second-class option, you know, so there's a snobbery in education, isn't it? it's all about the university route. If we had a skill system that was matched to the local economy, where we could ensure that we were helping people get towards real jobs in the labour market, I think that would, would, would make a massive difference, because there's a huge need now to give people green skills as we move towards a, a greener economy. We're in discussions about a new devolution deal for Greater Manchester with Michael Gove. We're hoping to sign that soon. Taking much greater control of the skills system is a long-held Greater Manchester ambition. 
but we think we've got the track record to do it and we think we would do exactly what you're calling for, get more people back into work. So, Ben, what we're talking about is people of a working age um, not in a job and not looking for a job. And we know that businesses are crying out for people. There are so many job vacancies. What's the answer? Well, I mean, I, I, I think there's, it's got to pay to work. It's got to be remunerative to work. And one of the problems we've got as a country, and I'm just going to throw some numbers out there because it's important to understand this, is that... On universal credit, the maximum amount you can claim, which, as it happens to be, is as a single mother with children living in London, is £23,000 a year. The average national wage after tax, believe it or not, is £23,000 a year. So the Actually, universal... Ben, ben. Just to be clear, what yeah. you're comparing is a national figure I'm, and a I'm, London I'm figure. So nation. if you look at the national maximum universal credit for single mother with children, it's 20,000. Okay. So it's so less. Slightly less. And, and, and wages nationally would be less, perhaps, than they are in London. Well, I'm but just comparing two national sure. figures as opposed to a national okay, and a London enough. figure. But it is very, very close. And what you don't do in order to get people to work. And one, thing I, one more thing I need to say before I, I, I go forward is there are 5.7 million people now claiming universal credit to some extent or another. That's nearly twice what it was before lockdown, and about half a million people have entirely fallen out of the workforce. This is a disaster for the United Kingdom. We've got to get people back into work. And what you don't do in order to get them back to work is to make it easier for them to make money on universal credit, on benefits, than they would if they actually went back into the workforce. And I'm afraid the recent budget is an utter disaster in that respect, because the Chancellor has frozen thresholds again. We all know we've got high inflation. We all know that people are going to be dragged into higher tax brackets. And as a result of that, it's going to pay not to work. And if it doesn't pay to work, we create a dependency culture. And that's where we're heading. And with that dependency culture, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we will end up with even bigger national debt. And we now have a national debt bigger than it's ever been since World War II. So I think the Chancellor, whatever the Chancellor's doing, is not the right thing. And it's critical that we reverse direction. OK. We've got a couple of hands up at the back. Yes, the, the woman in the glasses. Hi, I'm um, the former manager at the food bank here in Skipton and across North Yorkshire. And I'd just like to say that I never met a single person who was reliant on benefits who wouldn't rather have had a job and been working in four years of working at the food bank. Man there in the green sweater. I can't quite see what you're wearing. Yes. It's just interesting to hear uh, Ben talk about there being a dependency culture. The UK has some of the lowest benefits in the OECD, and there are 14.5 million people in this country in poverty. So are you saying that somehow benefits are too much, because that's clearly not true. Mm. We're people starving I, in this country. I wasn't country. saying benefits are too much. I'm saying it's not remunerative to work. We are overtaxed and overregulated as a country. We aren't growing as a country, and that is the fundamental problem. Woman at the back. Uh, I think the panel isn't considering the effects of long COVID and also very specifically the demographic of 50 to 64 year olds who have felt quite disenchanted actually with uh, the work life balance pre COVID. So we need to take all aspects of people who are not working in, uh, into consideration as opposed to just the skills basis. Well, Darren, let's talk about that because of this uh, just short of 9 million, 2.5 million are not seeking work because they're long-term sick. Yes, and then when you start to break up long-term sick into the different constituent parts, you're going to find a lot of complicated issues. Obviously, there's long-term unemployment, which means that people just become generally more apprehensive about stepping back into the world of work. And this is exacerbated by a labour market, which is inherently precarious as a necessity. You know, labour market flexibility for the employer is an economic imperative in this country, which is about creating insecurity within the workforce or the potential workforce. So that's difficult because that's a real structural problem. You're asking people to go, go back into a world of work, do a job that might not be much fun for pay that they can't live on. So that's a difficult sell. But also, just to go to the point about the Department of Work and Pensions and some of the, what I would say is quite radioactive discourse around unemployment, um, the culture that we have in this country since the welfare reforms of the coalition government is absolutely atrocious in terms of 
it's the most emotionally unsophisticated, unintelligent approach to how you get a person who has a level of fear and insecurity in their life to take that leap of faith. I think that a real positive approach to welfare reform would be recognising that a lot of these people who are long-term unemployed, they're not fraudsters, they have some issues going on in their lives, perhaps related to growing up in precarious and poverty circumstances, and we might want to look at integrating some aspect of mental health treatment yeah. into the welfare state where instead of sanctioning someone and causing them to have to go to a food bank or becoming destitute, you insist that they seek help for the problem that's preventing them from moving forward in their life. So what's the plan, Richard? Well, the, uh, it's, it's a really good question, actually, because it's something that the entire nation is grappling with at the moment. And there's a big review of it, just been kicked off by the Work and Pensions Secretary. But I totally understand uh, the, the view of the lady who, who asked the question. You know, what are we going to do about this? I mean, his work has to be as worthwhile as possible. So what are you going to do about uh, well, it? Well, let me uh, continue a little bit. Um, what we've already done this week is we've raised the uh, living wage to £10.42 an hour, which is a good step in the right direction. One of the interesting points, though, I think Ben didn't quite understand, perhaps, is that actually there's a lot of people in low-paid work who are also on universal credit. Uh, and one of, the one of the important things we can do is have people who are on universal credit, maybe not doing as many hours as they could, but encourage them into work. One of the things the government did last year, with MPs like me campaigning for it, was to reduce the taper rate. And I'd like to see, in the long term, us do more in that direction. Um, because that, the taper rate is particularly important, because that withdraws benefits from people the more they work. And if we can reduce that, as we already have done, uh, that can, that's already put £1,000 in the pocket of millions of families in this but, country but alongside a living wage. percent of the working population have to rely on some form of benefit or another to get by. And that is wholly an uh, unjustifiable position for the United Kingdom to be in. We've got to get people to be working and earning their wage and standing on their own two feet independently. You can't just top it up, Richard. The government has to have a set of policies which gets people entirely independent of the state. The state is not here uh, to underpin the workforce. No, I think what we need, though, is to help people. There'll be, there'll be a lot of people in those circumstances uh, who will, uh, for example, have childcare responsibilities and things which like that. Which are 20% of the workforce. Which, 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 is, which they also, so they may be able to do a certain amount of hours, but they also need help uh, more broadly. Uh, and I think there's, 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 a, there's been a big shift in the last few years. Under, before you had the universal credit system, people would literally pay more than 100% of their income if they were earning over, if they worked over 16 hours a week. Over, over, over 16 hours a week. We've, re, we've, we've totally changed that system so that you will always be better off the more you work. Okay, How me... much more you'll be better off, that's what we need to aim for. And the government's already made big steps in that okay. direction. And that's where I want to see us going. I don't think it's right, though, because you know, my dad was unemployed for eight years when he had severe mental health problems and um, also physical health problems. The, the, the best thing that he's done is get back into work um, and, in the long right. term. Okay. But that those people need support to do that. It's not just about cracking the whip. It's about both carrot and I'm stick. I'm not talking right. about okay. cracking the whip. Right. Charlotte, yeah. let's, let, let's get, get a word <laughs> in there, I, I wanted to bring up childcare because we just heard that word right there in the end amid all, any number of other things, but we haven't heard about it otherwise. And it's so expensive. And, of course, there are loads of people who aren't in work because someone's got to look after the kids. And if you think you've got a couple both on 20 grand a year, actually, it makes more sense for one of them to give up work because it probably costs more than 20 grand to actually have someone else look after their kids. So why would you have both people in work? And there needs to be something massive from both parties, actually, on childcare because the way it's going at the moment, the fact it only kicks in a few years into a child's life, the fact that it's only 20 or so hours a week, is just not working and I know there's no money at the moment but if you've suddenly got a bunch of people paying taxes who haven't been paying taxes before might have a bit of spare cash to spend on something like that okay I am going to try in this hour to move reasonably swiftly through quite a few questions so I'm going to move on to the next one before I do I'm going to let you know that question time will be on uh, the west coast of Wales and Aberystwyth next week and the week after that we're in Bishop Auckland in County Durham of course so if you want to be on either of those programs be part of our audience go to the question time website follow the instructions there we'd love to see you. okay a lot of people asked about this next question so let's hear from Chris Hawksworth after two disastrous Christmases due to pandemic lockdowns is the RMT union set, set on destroying this one or is it a legitimate dispute 
I'm going to go to the panel. Chris, what's your view? Uh, my view is they're holding the country to ransom and with two days before Christmas and two days in the next week with the trains out of position and all that jazz, effectively we have a month with virtually no trains and that disenfranchises the population, there's people wanting to make money uh, uh, over the Christmas period and then finally um, the, there's all the businesses that, that are relying Effective. on a decent Christmas. So we need the footfall. Richard, we know that the Transport Secretary met Nick Lynch today, the RMT. Uh, both seem to feel it was productive. Are you going to be able to sort this out well, before Christmas? The Transport Secretary is there to, is, and, he, and he's said it already, to help try and facilitate the dialogue re-emerging between the train operating companies and the unions. And they have to get together and come to an agreement. Because the truth is, this is about a rail service. And an important part of that is service. And we've not seen that at all from uh, the, and the, the truth is, probably to a degree from the operating companies and a degree from the unions. And we have to get them to get back together and get into a sensible place. The strikes at the moment, I just don't think you can justify this level of disruption uh, at the moment. I don't think it's necessary. It's hammering business. So how are you going to break the logjam? And actually, and not, we've not just got the RMT. Of course, in Scotland, uh, teachers have been on strike. Uh, lots of parents have to look after their kids during the day. We've got nurses, got postal workers that are up to Christmas. Is there any number of strikes? Coming up. No, I think I think particularly in terms of the RMT, who have been who have been particularly aggressive in their moves to strike action. I, you know, I, my first job was in a, a small hospitality business, um, and this period, this time of year, is absolutely vital for pubs, small restaurants. Uh, to try and you know, make their money, which then sees them through the first part of the next year. I, I really think that if the RMT should just take a step back and um, sit down with the employers and try and find a solution. Obviously, there's got to have to be modernisation in the rail network, and obviously they should get a fair deal. But there has to be a, the, a way for them to come together. I, and I don't think that strikes uh, at the moment are the way forwards. I think they just put the entire country on a precipice, and especially small businesses, after the gentleman said, have had two really tough years of coming out of COVID. Andy. Well, I think it is uh, legitimate. So let me just give you a, a few figures. So we're, we're dealing with the facts. If you look at the year uh, from September 21 to September 22, average pay increase in the public sector was 2%. In the private sector, 7%, which is better, but still not uh, inflation, because inflation was at 11%. So that is, that is the position of people going into this period that we're in with the cost of living as it is. And what I find hard to understand is why ministers haven't been sitting down with the key unions representing workers across the, 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 the piece through, through the months and negotiating. We, we've heard today from Mick Lynch that the previous transport secretary just wouldn't, wouldn't speak to him. When I was in the government, we sat down and we resolved things. We didn't have a nurses strike because we negotiated and because we resolved things. And if in these circumstances, with the cost of living as it is and where pay has been, and when you have a government that won't negotiate with the unions, because they haven't been negotiating with them, I don't think it's fair to blame people in those circumstances. The government has to bear a significant amount, if not all of the responsibility. Richard said that the RMT have been aggressive. They called off strikes a couple of weeks ago because there'd been some, wait a second, there'd been some progress. But when there's no progress, and when the, when the train operator says, well, we can't do it, the, only the government can sort out the, the, the deal, no wonder they've got to try and move things on. I, I would say don't blame people who are fighting for their family income at this difficult time. We're going into a winter where people are going to be at more and risk, where we're going to have people using candles to keep warm in the home, or some people not keeping warm at risk of going into hospital. And if the government let nurses, paramedics, firefighters go out on strike, that is going to be a serious risk to us all. So I would say they deserve a fair pay rise. Get behind them and give them a fair pay rise now. And in terms of the Labour leader's position, which is that he feels uh, senior Labour figures, MPs, should not be going out on the picket line, you would support going out on the picket line with the RMT? Uh, so, presumably, you believe Keir Starmer is wrong about I would, about and that. I've been on one, and... I was, I was on one this morning, but I'm... you think he's wrong but I'm, No, that, because I'm in a different position. In my role as Mayor of Greater Manchester, I have to represent the best interests of our residents, and many of the residents of Greater Manchester work in the services that have not had a fair pay rise. It's my... Wait a second, yeah, John. I was just going to say, so if you're wait, an, wait, an MP, or, not, or you, I, wouldn't, you wouldn't go. I, I'm, my job is to, to support people who are fighting to feed their families uh, now. 
And therefore, it is right, in my view, the Royal Mail this morning in Walkden, Greater Manchester, where they've been offered 2% when that privatised company has given massive dividends to their, to their shareholders. Is that justifiable at this time? When those people are out there in the cold, delivering the letters, running up to Christmas, they're getting 2%. They can't live on that. So don't blame them. It's, it's a narrative that the, okay. the, the Tories are running. Blame the workers, blame the... How about put That's them on the spot? Well, How about we get a government that starts governing this country, starts running things and How fixing things? How about a mayor things? to go to Manchester who stands up for a small business? You, Andy, you know just how much those, those, those businesses in the centre of Greater Manchester and across, actually, Greater Manchester have suffered over the last few years. Really tough times. It's about, we need to have uh, these small businesses, particularly the hospitality sector, need to have people in there and full support. Of, of course there's got to be a negotiated settlement, Andy, but surely but, the way to do it is not to cripple but, the other businesses who are really Richard, relying on that I don't, know, I don't know who you lecture. I've launched today with my nighttime economy advisor. Wait a second. It's good if a they're support all strong and they can't get in. Don't talk. Wait. For the hospitality what? What? Oh, industry. Oh, oh. Don't but talk over each other. No, no, wait. The point, no, wait asking. one second. If you talk over each other. I wasn't. No, <laughs> I don't think so. No one can hear anything. I see. I hear that you've disappointed nighttime economic advisor. There's a lot of hands up, so forgive me. I'm going to come to the audience. Yes, the man there near the front with the dark sweater. Yes. I think part of the challenge is that there's been so many secretaries within the government that the unions haven't been able to engage with them. There's been three secretaries in succession right. recently, so I think we need stability at the top to allow those negotiations to take place. OK, and the woman here at the front. I would substantiate the point of that gentleman. If ministers keep changing, who yeah. is going to do the engagement? <laughs> and while I empathise with the workers, we are going to have to have a conversation about modernisation. Because you go through Skipton train station, there is four barriers that accept tickets and there is three people there to support you putting a ticket in a machine. Now, it's good that they are there for the person who's got luggage or the elderly, but the reality is it cannot support three people running those machines. There is far too many people, so you are over-promising those workers' money. I empathise because we've got to find them other jobs and we've got to align that up because robotics and things will not help with levelling up. You know, we've got to address in the area what, you, what we need going forward and what we're going to lose. But we have to have conversations about modernisation and difficult conversations about the NHS and things like that, conversations that unfortunately are not vote winning. So the problem that we have in this short-term politi political arena where parties don't, you know, what you stand for, and, and you normally you say, put, you know, place above politics. Mm -hmm. When are politicians in this country going to put certain things like education, like NHS, like infrastructure on a, on a trajectory whereby we then have to agree and we judge politicians on their delivery? not their constant changing, so that we get nothing done. Man there with a the, with the light top. Yes, yes, you, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, I think the language we're using is really, really dangerous to say holding the country to ransom. Uh, I'm a secondary school science teacher, and uh, I recently voted in a ballot for industrial action, and it's not a choice that is ever taken lightly by anybody. I love my job, but... Similar with nurses, similar with other workforces, we just want a pay increase that's in line with inflation. Charlotte. I think I would probably agree with you on what you just said there. It's really interesting, actually. My, one of my best friends from university, he's voted Tory all his life, he's like the most Tory person you've ever seen. He was on strike over the summer, he's a barrister, and he was striking because the lowest paid barristers basically spend more on train tickets getting to the court than they actually make in a day. And that was a successful strike. The barristers wanted a 25% pay increase to make up for pay not going up in previous years and also hit inflation. They didn't get it. They got an offer of 15% from the then Justice Secretary. I think there have been three of those this year as well. So you've got the same problem that we were talking about there in transport. And they had another vote and they agreed to it. And that is, to me, a demonstration that these things can work. You don't get everything you want on either side, but you can have it resolved. And so I'm quite pro the strikes. I'm pro the threat of strikes because I've seen it work in practice. All of that being said, the fact that someone like that he is the person that I think 
least would be likely to go on strike. And when you've got people like that striking, there is something very, very odd going on in the economy. And I think that should be a red flashing warning sign to Conservative politicians if you've got people like that who are saying, right, I've had enough. Ben. Well, I, I think Andy said it all. If anything, Andy was too kind on the government. And it's not just about RMT, as Charlotte has mentioned. This is about the legal profession, it's about the teaching profession, it's about the NHS, who we all clapped during lockdowns. It's about the public sector across the board. And it's not just about one year's worth of, uh, uh, of under-average wa wage increases. In real terms, the public sector has been underpaid. In real terms, their wages have shrunk 30% over the last 12 years of Tory government. And the problem here, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Tories have been unable to grow our economy. If they could grow the economy, if they could get UK PLC moving forward, if they could deregulate, reduce taxes, we would all be moving forward to higher wages comfortably. But they haven't they done that. it. They, tried they that haven't a couple done of it. Ago, didn't they? they tried to reduce taxes and deregulate, and, and the, the markets crashed. And, 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 and actually, more. and actually, I'm going to defend Liz Truss. It is absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> it is brave. It is brave. Uh, but and also, is... Ben, what do you make of the response you got to that? Well, this? fair <laughs> enough. I mean, Liz Truss was utterly defenestrated by the Treasury and by the Bank of England. Now, I want to put, I want to put England, an, another... No, it did not. The Bank of England printed £500 billion worth of cash when, because the pension when, was, when the Rishi Sunak... Things. When Rishi Sunak wanted to lock down the economy, it printed £500 billion of cash without Rishi blinking. Rishi Sunak did not want to lock down the economy. Rishi Sunak, your government, locked the economy down and the Bank of England printed £500 billion. I think Let we're getting slightly far away from no, strikes on the justified. I tentatively would suggest. And, and Liz Truss was trashed because there was a problem with pension funds because they'd over-leveraged and the Bank of England wasn't prepared to buy more than £20 billion worth of gilts. Liz How Truss, had, bought, ben? Liz Truss had bought? the right idea. You cannot get out of this problem without growth. The only way for wages to go up, the only way for national debt to come under control is for the economy to grow. That is the only way. You will not do it through austerity. You will not do it by sitting on people's wages. You will not do it through higher taxations. We have borrowed to the hilt. Taxation is as high as it can be now, and the UK is destined in to enter a doom loop in the economy unless the Tories can get a grip of growth. I'll come back to you, but I'm just going to bring Darren in. Darren. Oh, yeah, trains. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm affected, by, I'm affected uh, by industrial action as a parent uh, in Scotland. Uh, the teachers have been striking today, and that does have an impact. I don't drive, so I use public transport. That does have an impact. But I choose not to centre my own individual needs at the heart of a much more fundamental discussion that has to take place about this country's economic structure. The problem isn't that there is not enough wealth being generated. In the instance of... of so you're agreeing with Ben, then? Um, well, I'm just... Uh, nah, I don't think <laughs> not, not what I was expecting. <laughs> I don't think agree, there's going to be much of a consensus uh, between <laughs> Ben and I. Um, but, you know, this idea that the Tories are floating with their old playbook that they've been rolling out since the days of Arthur Scargill, it's not going to wash anymore. Because people understand that these operators that are profiting still, paying dividends, are skimming off the top, creating a surplus by suppressing wages, skimming off the top. The service seems correlated, the expense of the service seems correlated to how unpleasant it is to use. And this idea that people standing up against that, quite frankly, corruption, is uh, this idea that people standing up against it might lead to businesses failing and that Mick Lynch, as an individual, holds the economic Please, fate of, com of com No, 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 I'm not finished, mate. Sorry. The economic <laughs> fate of companies <laughs> and people... <laughs> I should try, I'm you try. should try. I'm trying. It's a, no, it's a Sorry, nonsense, this idea that Mick Lynch is going to make businesses fail and not the dysfunctional economy that the Tories have created. Quite so, right. so, just a second, Quite just right. a second. <laughs> yeah. I, will be, I will be very brief. Uh, look, so the RMT are on strike in London on the, for the tube, which is wholly publicly owned. Who is this magic man at the end of the machine who's making all this money and screwing the workers? Well, I'm talking in terms of the rail operators. Well, and well, what the TfL real... is a rail operator as well. 
The issue here is obvious. You just, you know, the truth is that the, the, the truth is that actually that we need to have a proper modernisation plan for a lot of these industries. And whether, as I've just given you the example of a publicly owned one or one which is, an, which is privately operated, but essentially a public service, we need a proper modernisation plan. And that's the truth but behind Richard, this. Can I just make the point, though? Don't we also need, though, public services, essential services, to be run properly? The government's been hiding behind strikes when actually the performance of the railways has fallen off a cliff. Absolutely. If you tried to go from Skipton to Manchester this morning, you'd have got to Leeds and you'd have found every single Trans-Pennine service to Manchester was cancelled. And the government tries to say it's all unions. It's not. The railways are collapsing under... Avanti West Coast is a collapsing service on their watch. A&E, people can't get seen in A&E. This is, this is a Tory tactic to blame the workers for their own mismanagement of essential services, and people really shouldn't fall for it. The railways are a disgrace right now. They've done nothing to fix it. If this was happening to the railways in the south-east of England, you can be sure they'd be having okay, summits and they'd be right. getting the rail okay. operators. Okay. They've okay. they three thoughts of second-class okay. citizens okay. when it comes to transport. Okay. Andy, uh, Andy, if you want to get people, you don't need to, need to hire a new nighttime economy advisor, you just need to get people able to travel into the centre of Greater Manchester. And if you want to do that, have a word with your You're mates. In the, the have, a mate with the, have a word with your mates in the unions, right, and get yeah. it sorted out. All right. OK. How about you do it? Uh, You're a transport minister. OK. Uh, they don't fund me, Andy. You know. All right. I'm, we could talk about this all night, but I am so... I am here to do your bidding and respond to the questions that you submitted when you arrived. So that's what I'm going to do. On this next question, quite a lot of you asked. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It'll become obvious why, but, but a lot of you asked, so, so let's go for it. Um, Bob Long. Here's Mark Hancock excelling himself in the jungle, <laughs> <laughs> showing fearlessness and resolve. Right. Now, the fact that you're laughing makes me think you don't think that. Is that right? Or do you think actually he is? Personally, I would boot him out of politics okay. tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, I'm... All right. But... Now, look, I'm going to come on the panel. But the, the thing is, the country have tried to dishonour him, to, to bring him down, to embarrass him and everything. Well, basically, I've got to give the man credit. He's socked them in the eye. He's hit back at them. He's, he's shown something I didn't believe he would ever have it. And it just amazes me. OK. So, I mean, I, I'm sure not everyone is watching I'm a Celebrity, but, I mean, one thing Matt Hancock is, has been doing is he's been acing those trials and getting, you know, doing incredibly well at things that, frankly, I wouldn't go near and, and just look horrifying to me. We've done this a couple of times on the programme, and the overwhelming consensus on the panel, and almost to a man and woman in the audience, has been... It's a horrendous idea. He should never have done it. It's, it's risible. I'm just wondering if that's changing. Can I just have a show of hands for people who, let's just see, who think actually maybe it was not such a bad idea on Matt Hancock's part, possibly even a good one? OK. Well, let's hear from some of you then. This woman here in the front. <coughs> and actually, the rest of you, keep your hands up so I can see where you are. Thanks. Yeah, when, when he was going in, I thought it was the wrong thing to do, he's got a job to do, it, it, it's not, it, it isn't the right thing. But I think his personality's come across, I think he's answered questions, I think he's, he's been sort of put under a lot of interrogation by the people that were in there and asked some difficult things. And he seems to have come across quite open and, and honest. But then I don't know whether he's being honest or not, because he's pretty good at coming out with the answers. OK. Uh, the, the man at the back there with the... Black, so you lay on, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, Matt Hancock, would he have got the same publicity or bad publicity if it had been, say, Strictly Come Dancing or, you know, Bake Off, whatever it been? I mean, you could say that if he did Strictly... I'm just putting yeah. it aside. Well, if he did he Strictly or Bake Off, he could, he could perhaps talk to his constituents more easily yeah. than yeah. if he's in the jungle in yeah. Australia. It's because he's in the jungle, he's getting persecuted in such a way. Right. And, and you think that's wrong? Mm. OK. Definitely. Man there at the back, in the grey jacket. I just think that people are too quick to forgive Matt Hancock at the moment. Yes, it's light entertainment at the moment, but all those deaths that he had a hand in, people's grandmothers, grandfathers, aunties, uncles that were forced back into care homes, all these deaths that we couldn't go to, and he's willing to go into the jungle and people are willing to forget that. I, I think it's wrong that people are so quick to change their minds on him. OK. And the woman in the glasses. Yes. I think he's 
cobbler decided that his life's over in politics, so he's trying to make a new life for himself in, uh, in other ways. And is he winning you over? Um, he has won me over slightly. I don't think he okay. should. I don't think he should win, and I still don't agree with a lot of things he did. But I do think that he must have decided that his life in politics is coming to an end, and he needs a new avenue in life. So. Okay. Look, I'm going to come around. I, I want to. Listen, just give me an answer for like 30 seconds or something, because we've got very big topics I want to talk about. But since so many of you asked about them, it's very interesting to see that very notable change of view from the times we've done this before. Darren, very quickly. Uh, you guys obviously have a, a, an appropriate level of empathy, and that's why this public relations campaign around Matt Hancock is working so effectively. <laughs> he has a book to sell, no doubt. And uh, in that book, I'm sure he'll detail not just all the terrible things that he went along with, all the lies he told, but also the fact that he was unfaithful to his wife and then has since somehow tried to cash in on that shame that he was absolutely supposed okay. to experience for it. Charlotte. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't been watching, partly because I worried that I might suddenly decide uh, that he's fantastic. But <laughs> tell you what, I've, I've actually I've spent the last three weeks trying to get my editor to let me write about Matt Hancock. And every week, someone else, another columnist, has come in and taken the idea. So I'm going to tell you guys about it instead. Here is my idea <laughs> that I have not been able to get past the editor. This is so weird and medieval. It's, you've got Matt Hancock in there, you've got that other guy, Sean What's-His-Face, who cheated Walsh, on his I girlfriend. I think so. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And they're both there asking for our forgiveness through basically ritual humiliation. It's like when people used to get put in the stocks and have tomatoes thrown at each other. <laughs> and I was thinking of doing some very kind of pretentious thing about how the breakdown of organised religion means that this is our moral system now. <laughs> but what I think it might just be is everyone's had the same idea, it's a pretty basic PR idea. You know, it's well, just it appears about like it could be working. It could be working. It could be working okay. because, yeah, yeah, maybe this is how we enforce our lives now. I don't know. Ben. Well, I th Are you a big fan of I'm a Celebrity watching that every night at home? <laughs> I haven't watched a single episode. You surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there are no circumstances under which Matt Hancock can be forgiven for his role as health secretary. But what do you think about the and... change of view we're getting here? <laughs> I... If, if there is a genuine change of view in the populace about Matt Hancock, because he's able to eat cockroaches and the genitalia of a kangaroo. I think we are in for real trouble in the <laughs> okay. political sphere. Okay. Matt Hancock presided over an utter disaster uh, as, uh, as health secretary, and there are no circumstances. I'm sorry to be serious um, after being, you know, following Darren and Charlotte so eloquently, but I, to bring it back to serious note, there are no circumstances on which Matt Hancock can be forgiven. Richard. Uh, look, Would I, you echo that? Uh, I think during his time in government, Matt faced some almost impossible decisions uh, at a very difficult time. However, I do think... The, well, one do you think he took all the one, right ones? Uh, I, well, we, we, will have to, we will have to... There's a big inquiry looking into all of that. So I think there's some things, which, some things which were definitely the right thing to do, some things which definitely, in retrospect, you wouldn't have done if you had your time again. But, you know, it's easy to look at those things in uh, retrospect. Uh, look, or I would releasing have got... elderly from hospitals into care homes so they could okay. spread COVID. Yeah, I, I... I just want everyone to remember that. <laughs> and I'm not in any sense downplaying the importance of these issues. No, and not I, at all, I, I, Ben. I... Just in terms of the question, is Matt Hancock excelling himself in the jungle, showing fearlessness and resolve, as, as you put it? Well, I have seen, I've, so I, I, I'm not an avid watcher, but I have seen some clips of him. Uh, and Sorry, you're among friends. You can say you watch it. I, I've, uh, I've, seen a, I've seen a few clips of it. Look, I, I think I thought Boy George was quite mean to him at certain points. Uh, I, I hope Jill Scott wins. And, okay. I, uh, okay. and I think that... Um, <laughs> uh, no, the I'm... only clap I'm getting of the evening. And, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think that... Uh, but I, I, know, look, I wouldn't have gone in as an elected MP. Okay. I think you've got, he's, going, he's got an important role to do. If he doesn't want to be in politics anymore, then there's a, there's a clear route out. So is he... And this is not my view, I'm simply asking the question, is he in any sense redeeming himself, then? Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, he's showing he's got talent and he's clearly better at showbiz than he is at politics. Uh, better at Bush Tucker trials than clinical trials, for, for sure. Oh. I think is, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's not, in my view, a bad person, but it is a bad judgment because Politicians should be about we, what, what's good for us, but this is all about me, isn't it? Me, me and my sort of situation and a cost of living crisis for his constituents. And the thing I would just say, echoing the gentleman at the back, look at the Guardian front page today. A journalist, David Conn, has written a pretty authoritative account of PPE. 
and certain politicians in the Lords allegedly benefiting to the tune of £29 million. You could run rural bus services around Skipton for a year for £29 million. And he presided over a situation where that level of funding was going... I mean, these are things that he should be here answering for, not okay. in the jungle trying to curry favour with the celebra other celebrities and, and the British Even public. Even you want to make right. amends for something, you go to the people that you've hurt and you ask them, what would you like me to do to make this better? You don't just assume that they want to all see you on television running around. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right, let's move on. I think that's quite enough on that. Let's move on to a question from Andrea Spensley. Will there be a time in the future when the more wealthy will be asked to pay for NHS treatment? Now, Andrea, I am assuming you're asking this because there was a, 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 a leak of a draft report from NHS bosses in Scotland that uh, came out this week where they were discussing a number of things, um, including the possibility of a two-tier health service where wealthy patients would pay for treatment. Um, I say, they're not saying that's what they were going to do, but this, they were discussing a number of, of, of options that they were considering. Darren. Any discussion, I think, about bringing that sort of approach into the NHS is a red flag uh, and should be regarded as such. However, what I will say is, when public services are run into the ground um, through an economic model, which just seems to necessitate a kind of steady managed decline of everything that we come to expect in a sort of functional society, then eventually these conversations will happen. I mean, when, you, when you've got a prediction that um, health spending could rise up by 2024, so very soon, up to 44% of public spending. Yeah, I mean... Is, is that tenable? Is it surprising that questions like this are being asked? No, of course not, and that, that's what I say, but, I mean, part of that is, in my view, my assessment of the health issues is partly to do with the health inequality at the heart of even the public healthcare system, where you have a kind of inverse relationship between the needs in certain areas and what is actually provided. So more affluent people who have less complex and less numerous and less frequent health problems will get maybe on average a minute more with their doctor. Doctors want to go to affluent areas because it's less stressful. So this leads to a fundamental inequality, which then creates further health problems down the road. Because and is the answer just... just putting more money into the NHS, or do you think it needs reform? We need, it, it needs to be reformed, but we also need to start taking a more preventative approach to health generally, so that we are actually understanding how do we design our communities? How does stress impact people's health? How does having a bookies, a chippy and a pub as your local economy impact <laughs> local health? And really just trying to redesign it in a more sophisticated way. Ben. Will there be a time in the future when the more wealthy will be asked to pay for NHS? Well, I, I've always been supportive of a means-tested access to the NHS. I think the wealthy should be asked to pay more. If you can afford to pay for it, you should pay for it. Well, I mean, you could argue they do through their taxes. They d well, they pay... I mean, they do. Of course they do. But if they avail themselves... I mean, we're talking about the actual point of service, aren't we? We're talking about uh, yes. free at the point of delivery. And, you know, when that, when that concept was developed, the population of the United Kingdom was less than half of what it is now. People didn't live as long. The burden on the taxpayer was much lower. And I think for us to, uh, you know, to assume that that can go on indefinitely with the, um, with the state picking up the tab all the time, I, I think is just unrealistic. It's going to break the bank. And so we have to have a really honest, difficult discussion about the NHS, and it does need reform. OK. The man in the grey sweater. Yes, uh, do I need to remind us all about the National Programme for IT and all the billions that were pumped and never reached any of the services? They ended up in, in consultancies, in, in systems that never saw the light of day. Uh, so is, is that how we're helping our nurses, by, by giving the money that actually never translates into, into a service? OK, and the, the man in the dark blue sweater over there. Oh, sorry, jacket, yes. Hi, uh, um, my wife's uh, a sister in a, an outpatient in uh, Wharfdale, um, and most of her time is spent looking at emails and arranging things. A lot of time and a lot of money is wasted on people missing appointments. She, you know, it's so frustrating. Uh, some people just like to use the NHS, but then it's a bit of both ways as well, isn't it? You know, try, try and keep your appointments, and then it's just a knock-on effect. It just goes on and on with people. You know, so it's not just one way, and it's not just the, the, the rich that are abusing the, you know, the fact. OK. The, the man in the glasses and the white shirt. Yeah, 
Hi, so I'm a fifth year medical student, so I've kind of witnessed healthcare change over the past five years. And it's literally due to chronic underfunding of the NHS. Pre-pandemic, the pandemic's only exacerbated what we see now is the reason that we are in the situation we are in. As a, as a aspiring doctor for next year, I would like to treat everyone at the point of care, regardless of how rich or how poor you are. And it's really sad to see in this day and age that your wealth kind of translates to how much access you have to healthcare. And, and can, can I ask you, do you think, given what a proportion it's forecast to, to be of public spending, as I said, 44% yeah. by 2024, do you think it's a question of, of, of more funding solely, or do you think actually the model we have is, is, is not tenable? Some of it really needs to be changed. It's really not focused. Like, you've seen we just cycle through health secretaries. For example, we've got nurses striking because we're not able to retain them, so it's a vicious cycle of they leave and we get new ones and they get paid a low wage and then they leave. For example, junior doctors are balloting to strike because an F1, a junior doctor's salary, is now £28,000, but when you break it all down, it's looking at around about £11, £12 take home. So our, our force leave, these highly skilled labourers, we're leaving for better pay in Australia. And then you've got that model, which just it's just a vicious loop. Okay. And then you are going to get um, these cycles where we're going to have to, you know, do a means-tested NHS because we don't have the workforce in, in place. Okay. The woman here at the front. Yeah. I've had to wait six weeks to get a doctor's appointment and things. Hey, uh, hey, wait. The, you've had to wait six weeks, six weeks for, for a telephone appointment as well. So I've only just been able to get that. I've now got to wait a further four weeks to actually be seen in person. The quality of the... Uh, service is going down yet the costs are going up it's ridiculous like it you can't get seen if it was something serious like cancer or something god forbid that would have knock-on effect to the actual service and end up putting the costs up for the nhs in the long run surely it should be trying to focus on cutting down the uh, waiting time and things to actually cut down the cost during the long run and stop the actual amount of money that's been wasted by uh, missed appointments and things because you're having to wait so long to actually be seen can i just ask you what are you being told as to why you're having to wait 10 weeks uh, to see because a GP in I person. couldn't uh, get anybody available because it uh, had so many booked up and things and because I needed to see or uh, speak to a specialist uh, there was an extra long waiting list for this so I had to wait six weeks to be able to see somebody. Andy. Well that's terrible and uh, that shouldn't uh, be happening and I think there's a really important distinction to be made here between the way the NHS is at the moment and the level of funding it has and the way it's been run and separating that from the NHS model. Because actually, if you look at the NHS model, it has proven over time as the most efficient way of delivering good healthcare to a whole population. And you measure that by the amount of GDP we spend as a country on healthcare. It's much lower, much lower than the rest of Europe, or it traditionally has been. And it's significantly lower than the US because market-based systems create bureaucracy, more bureaucracy, and, and more duplication, but, but also market-based systems. When you look at our survival rates well, uh, and, and the outcomes for, for, for the NHS, so British cancer patients, for example, have worse survival rates after five years compared to the European average in nine out of ten cancers. Well, and they obviously have a different systems, many of which are insurance You can look at on different indicators, but the Commonwealth Fund is an international organisation that rates healthcare. And when, I'm going back to the time when we were in government, it was rated number one in the world on pretty much, pretty much everything. Public satisfaction was high. Now, I, I, you know, I think some of the... Uh, I mean, that the, was, and I don't mean this rude, that was a bit of a while ago. I mean, it was a while ago. I mean, the, and the things that we didn't get right as a government, absolutely, no government gets everything, everything right. But the NHS model can be run well. And the thing I was going to say, the thing to think about is, if you have charges, that means that people often don't seek preventative care. This is what happens in the US. They don't go, and then they present needing much more expensive care because they leave it. And, and that's why there's a sort of a cost built into those other kind of systems. Just to finish on the point of reform, because I, I, mean, I heard what you said before, by the way, and I, I, you know, I absolutely understand what you're saying. And I'm not somebody who's ever turned my face away from changing the way things work in, in different times. The big reform I think the NHS needs, and it's on the principle I was saying before about good preventative care, is to provide social care on NHS terms. So effectively, provide the simple preventative care in people's homes in the same way that we provide NHS care. Why? Because that means you spend a lot less just keeping people supported at home 
rather than what we do at the moment is leave people without the support they need in the home and then they end up hospital and then they end up stuck in hospital. So I said this 10 years ago as health secretary, I believe in the century of the ageing society, we need a, a healthcare system that can look after people's social, physical and mental needs, that can see the whole patient and the whole person. And I would say that is the single biggest reform we need to ensure you've got a system that can look after people from home to hospital okay. and back again with one team around the person. That's the reform the NHS needs. Charlotte. I suppose I'm listening to you, Andy, and I, I know you're going to tell me that you're not in the shadow cabinet and this isn't quite your job, but there's no one from the shadow cabinet here. And I really want to believe that, let's be honest, probably when Labour get in in two years' time, they'll be able to sort all this out. But there is no cash at the moment. Taxes are pretty high. Borrowing more seems like a pretty foolhardy thing at this point. And no front bench Labour politician seems to be able to tell me where they're going to get extra cash from for the NHS. Do you have a sense of if what... If you're asking me directly now, it's about a good workforce strategy and paying the nurses properly back to that debate before, because the amount they're spending on agency nurses right now is totally unjustifiable. So the keep... agency bill is massive. So you can keep if the you have a proper recruitment strategy, you can bring a lot of money out of agency spend. OK, so you keep the overall bill the same, but you... Move around. Even within the overall effect, field, what, what, what do you think, in terms of mm. the question, will there be a time in the future when the yeah. more wealthy will be asked to pay for <laughs> NHS treatment? So it, it kind of made me laugh in a, a very dark way because um, it's sort of a joke my friends and I will make to each other when someone mentions the state pension, we'll be like, yeah, you're not getting one of those. Um, you know, <laughs> social care, you're not getting any of that. NHS, you're not getting that. It'll all be gone by the time we get there, um, which I hope is not true. But I do think. I've got a lot of friends in the same position as you. They have been trying to get GP appointments for absolutely ages and they simply can't. And actually, they're not like bankers. They're not millionaires, these people. They're journalists. Um, that certainly doesn't give you a banking salary. But they would probably be pretty happy to pay 50 quid to get an appointment quickly. All of that being said, I don't think it would work because the way NHS spending per person works is basically nothing, 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 nothing something goes wrong, everything, and suddenly it's loads. And that is what we're all paying into, basically, an insurance system. And so what would happen is you've got all these people probably happy to pay 50 quid, but none of them are going to be able to suddenly cough up 80 grand because something's gone really badly wrong. And so I think that system probably wouldn't work because of the way it would hit people's lives. The woman in the pink sweater. Um, the lady over there was saying about the problem getting, and you were saying about the problem getting GP appointments. Now, the government in 2020 promised that they would have, we would have 6,000 more GPs by 2024. It's nearly 2023. There are less GPs today than there were in 2015, 2016. Less GPs, more patients, and more complex needs for patients because the patients aren't being seen in hospital, aren't being treated in hospital. It, the government has also capped at 7,500 the uh, medical school places, which is actually a decrease on the year before. Now, if we don't increase the medical places drastically, very quickly, it takes 10 years to train, have a fully qualified GP, 10 years. If you don't do that like now, well, like a couple of years ago, we're, we're going to be in such trouble, probably, and this young lady's weight will be nothing compared to that. And quite honestly, the GPs are absolutely sick of being the, the sort of scapegoat, the whipping boy for government problems, and it just sort of diverts. OK, the, well, let's put know. that to the representative we have from the government here. So I'm going to ask you to answer the main question, but what about uh, the, 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 the lady's first point, which is what happened to all the GPs you promised? Well, can Where I, are they? Can I just ask the first, answer the first question first, and then I'll come on to GPs and everything else. First of all, uh, I don't think there's... Basically, we all pay for the NHS, uh, and we all pay, essentially, in proportion to our ability to pay. Uh, we all pay through income tax, national insurance and other taxes for it. And I think it would be a disaster if the Scottish Government really are proposing to try and do something separate and remove people from a system. Because if you remove, start to remove some people from a system, then who do you remove next? I mean, the Scottish Government... Remove, I, mean, I agree with In that. fairness, I, I, the Scottish I, Government has said they are not considering doing that. Okay. But Nicholas Sturge has been quite clear NHS about Scotland. it. This was NHS Boss in Scotland discussing a number of things of which this was one. I, I mean, you could argue the Prime Minister's already decided to... 
to, to do this himself. I mean, he's registered with the private GP practices, yeah, so he's, he's not, already he, voting with his no, feet. No, no, he's, he's paying his full taxes and not taking... I'm not suggesting no, he, and, he and isn't, just, no, but I'm, what no, I'm no, saying no. is he's, he's decided to, to, to and, opt out and, and, and go for, for uh, Prime. But he's still paying into the system. There's no, there's no idea that he couldn't access those services if he wanted to. Yeah, it's I, not actually, great, though, isn't I actually it? wanted to agree with Andy on something quite uh, violently in a weird way uh, around the social care. Um, he's absolutely right. And this is an issue that both political parties have kicked each other into uh, for a long time. The Conservatives did it to Andy in the 2010 general election, Labour did it to the Conservatives in the 2017 general election, and both of them, was, both of them made big mistakes, uh, in my personal opinion. And the view, government's just delayed doing, the plans for social well, they've, they've had to, given the economic circumstances we're in. Um, but, I, but I think he's absolutely right. My mum's actually a, a ward clerk in a community hospital over in East Lancashire, not very far from here. Uh, and the discharges and getting people into social care is the biggest issue. Now, the government's put 500 million quid more into that. Apparently, there's 13,500 people who could be in uh, residential care or at home in beds in, in hospitals at the moment. That stacks all the way back up to acute hospitals, which then stacks all the way through into your ambulances discharging into A&E. Um, and we need to get that social care thing solved. We will only solve it... If both political parties, which and, I, and both political parties are committed to the NHS, NHS has been under Conservative uh, and Labour governments over the years, but we'll only do it if we stop playing politics around social care. Well said. All right. And what about the lady's point there? Where are all the GPs you promised? Uh, well, look, the, in terms of GPs, um, there are more doctors in the NHS. I don't know specifically. Uh, that, uh, you, you may very, you, you may very, you may very well be you, right. You may very well be right. Um, uh, but there are there are more doctors in the NHS. There are 29,000 more nurses in 2019. Um, but you, but the lady's absolutely right. Primary care is a major concern uh, for everybody's constituents. And getting those appointments, if you if you are if you are in urgent need, you should be able to get an appointment on the day. Obviously, for some things, people may want to book in advance if it's a routine scan. I mean, or they should be able to, but, but, but we know they can't. The one with the glasses there. and the scarf there. I've been a nurse for over 40 years. Oh, so let's I hear from you. You're, you're actually in the business. Well, like the, the, the gentleman uh, along the row from me, Nye Bevin himself said, the NHS will survive as long as people are prepared to fight for it. And we absolutely have to fight for our NHS. Once you start bringing in people being means tested, that's the thin end of the wedge, absolutely. and the threshold will go down, and we've lost the health service that we've had for the last <laughs> In the, in the orange scarf. Yes, thank you. It, it's just shown how incredibly important it is to have a good and functional NHS. We were talking earlier about people being economically inactive. Mm. Mm. Part of that is waiting for appointments when they're not well and waiting for treatment. Another big part of it is the toll that the cost of living crisis is taking on mental health. Fund us properly, make nursing and clinical, uh, well, and health and social care generally, a good profession that's well paid with good working conditions. We want to be proud of our profession. I've just voted to strike and that was hard. That was a really difficult decision. Language like holding the country to ransom and things. I don't want to strike, but we've been waiting for jam tomorrow for decades now. And it hasn't come. Thank and, you. And there is a fun, can I just say, there is Very a, fun, there is a fundamental the thing here. We have a, 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 you know, an, a population that is ageing. 44% of public spending is going... 44% of public spending yeah. is going to the NHS more than ever before, more, than, more per head, than, even real terms, than ever before. It's just trying to match that need is really difficult, which is why social okay. care reform is so I'm important. I'm really sorry we are out of time. I think the point you also make is you feel insulted by... It. By suggesting you're holding the country ransom, and I think that I don't that's... want to strike. Okay, we hear you. But I need more money. <laughs> we all, all nurses, care workers, doctors, we need to be able to lead reasonable lives without having to strike. So, pay us, please, what we deserve. <laughs> And on that note, our time is up. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for our audience here in Skipton, making your points so powerfully. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. We'll be in Aberystwyth next week. Don't forget, if you want to be part of our audience. But for now, from Question Time. <laughs>